Hello. Hello, Manchester. Are you having a good day? Oh, Manchester. There's no rain outside. It's all good, yeah? We're good. Welcome to Showstream TV Live. I'm Shel Zanna. Tonight, joined by three awesome people, heavily involved in the music scene right here in Manchester for a little bit of a chat. Um, we're also going to be watching sets from the incredible false advertising. Jen sat on the left over there. Dead Naked Hippies, all the way from Leeds, sounding fierce. And, of course, Manchester via Hebden Bridge, Sly Antics, who are in the building, looking bouncy and bright and ready to take off, basically. If you've never seen them live, they will launch across the stage. Uh, but before we get into all that, we've been running a few polls on Showstream UK on Twitter, asking if you think the album is still relevant. Is it singles all the way now? Is it albums just irrelevant now? Um, I think there was something out online today that Matty Healy from the 1975 had said about, you know, he only makes albums, doesn't release singles. So if you want to vote, vote now, Showstream UK on Twitter. And uh, I'll tell you what the results are at the end of this little panel. But our panel guests tonight are... Jeff Thompson in the centre there, the co-founder of Unconvention, which is happening just a couple of weeks right here in Manchester. 7th and 8th of March, isn't it, Jeff? Yes. yes right. And also, he works for Off Axis, uh, which helps artists build a national tour, gig swaps, that kind of stuff. We'll come to that. Welcome, Jeff. Nice to have you with us. Thank you, uh, secondly, Jen Hingley, best known for fronting and pretty much playing most of the instruments in false advertising at one time or another. She's experienced in various things, graphics, videos, websites, getting your band gigs at South by Southwest. This girl, she's done it. She's done it all. And finally, to my left, Bill Cummings, the editor and founder of Music Blog. God is in the TV. He is. He's freaking us all out. Uh, he's been featured in The Guardian, Uncut, DIY magazine, Pitchfork, is this right? Have you just made this up? Yeah. <laughs> Clash magazine and more. Welcome, Bill. Are you all right? Thank We've you. literally yeah. got half an hour to rattle through this thing and, you know, get some... Make it sound like it's painful. We want to get as much information out there and shared with you guys as possible. So, firstly, we'll start with Jen. How do you organise yourself as a self-managing band? Because you are so industrious that there is a lot of lessons to be learned here. Um, well, it's all... I guess it all comes from the songs. Um, we, we obviously are a band who wants to release music, we want to make music, we want to, that's what we, we're here to do, that's what we enjoy doing, we want to play music and hopefully get to go to lots of different places in order to do it. So, so I suppose it, it all kind of started with us writing songs and recording, being able to record them. We were really lucky in that Chris and our band when we started, um, and still is like a, a really talented pr producer and he had access to a studio space so we basically before we did anything we were in the privileged position of being able to kind of test things out in, in a sort of quite DIY studio but um but still a kind of a proving ground um, before we were kind of happy enough to to share it with the world and it took us quite a while in order to do that um and we we it kind of took us I don't know like a year and a half and then we, we kind of launched with this this single that we put out and we were kind of like this fully formed thing even though we weren't really which was quite funny um so i guess everything as, as a self-managing band everything kind of leads on to the next thing and quite neatly um we've been very lucky in that we've done something which has led to something else which has led to something else um so quite naturally we found ourselves playing in manchester and then being invited after a while to play in other places like London and then, and then kind of expanding to other places like that as we kind of released more music as we went on. So, so every opportunity has kind of led to another one and we're kind of really lucky in that we've never really felt like that momentum has stopped. So as, as a manager of a band, I mean, I, I plan things sometimes. So for example, at the moment we're planning what, we've, we've done some recording and we're, we're planning how we're going to basically put that out ultimately so and we're planning um music videos uh, single release dates and things like that so that's that's quite a fun time when you can kind of do anything you want in your head but then you realize that maybe you can't actually do it or afford to do it all um but we've we've always had something to plan for and that's what what i enjoy about it the most that we've never felt like we're sort of having to having to event opportunities. It's always felt very natural. Do you literally play to your strengths? Like, Chris, you're doing this. Josh, you're doing that. I'll, totally. I will do that. 
Totally, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we divide responsibilities between us. Um, and, but it all comes from the music, I think. It's, we, that's what gives us a reason to do anything, which is the way it should be, I think. And you've got to believe in your product, haven't you? Because if you don't believe in your product, who else is going to believe in your product, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. Please like our music. <laughs> so how do you distribute... It's false advertising, by the way. Uh, how do you distribute your music? How do you get it on all those platforms? And what do you focus on, including social media? So I think in our experience, we tried releasing music in a few different ways. Um, we started off when we first um, came onto the scene in 2015 by releasing an album, and we released that digitally, and we... Um, we got CDs produced that we sold on Bandcamp and at shows. Um, so we've, we've kind of done it that way and we released some singles to promote the album. And then since then we've, we've done quite a lot of singles um, in a row and then we've, we've released EPs um, surrounding those singles and done tours um, promoting them. So we've just, over the last few years we did an EP called Brainless and then an EP called, um, oh my God, it's got the longest name in the world. I would be so much happier if I just stopped caring. And, and then, <laughs> we got, said uh, that. then we released a, an album in Japan. Um, so in terms of digital releases, we've done loads and we tend to distribute through a platform called AWOL, um, who uh, gets, uh, they basically send your, do all the sort of meta lab, uh, metadata tagging and things and send it to all the online platforms. I think in, in the future, we're gonna be a bit more strategic about where we go to. We're certainly gonna do a physical release next. Um, which is something huge to learn about when you've never done it before and only worked. Um, our only physical release has been, we, we released through Two Pure Singles Club a couple of years ago. We did a standalone single, which was on vinyl, um, on seven inch, which was a really awesome experience. Really glad we got to do that. And then we've also released an album in Japan. Um, those are our only physical releases thus far. So it's, it's quite a learning curve um, when you're sort of trying to plan something like that. So. So yes. <laughs> I did scour the shelves of Tower Records in Tokyo oh, yeah. for that record. Couldn't find it. It was oh. in there somewhere, but I couldn't find it. And also Paul Riddlesworth, who ran Two Pure, Two Pure Singles Club, now based in Manchester, running a record label called Dipped in Gold, um, if you want to look him up, by the way. Thank you, Jen, for the wonderful insight. Over to Jeff next. This is all about touring, all about getting you gigs and stuff. How can a band or an artist get themselves a festival slot? What's the best suggestion? Oh, the best thing to do is get a major record deal. Well, in a perfect <coughs> Sell world. about seven or eight million records, and then the festivals will ring you up and say, do you want to come and play our festival? I'm, I'm doing that now, right now. Uh, if you... Jen, you've done festivals, I'm sure you know. Uh, the, the problem with festivals is the same as the problem with Radio Shell. The stuff that everyone listens to is hard to get on. Radio 1's daytime playlists, you need to market and you need people behind you that are pushing that because they've got strategies and plans to make you famous and all of the support, and that goes hand in hand with playing the big stages at those festivals, which is common sense, I'm sure you knew that. So the trick with anything you do is you've got to pitch it where you are, and that's actually quite a lot of research. So you look at the bands around you that are a year ahead of you and where were they playing last year? and what festivals, and the good thing is festivals want to put on new music. Most of, no, no one's the enemy, it's just that things are very limited. Yep, festivals aren't the enemy, the radio aren't the enemy, everyone wants to support new music, you support new music, etc. but there's only so many hours in the day, so many festival stages, etc., etc. so many pairs of ears. So it's how you manoeuvre into that, isn't it? Um, if you know people, that's a good thing. If you apply just, to give you, I always sort of quote the figures because we do I've run events and we do panels about these sort of things. Your typical festival is getting five to seven thousand applications from new bands for their kind of apply to play stuff, five to seven thousand for thirty or forty slots, so you don't have to be Einstein to work out <coughs> the odds. Well, they're genuine. You know, introducing does a great job, doesn't it, of filtering through yeah, your Jack Garrett's from yeah. like this stage to this stage to this stage. But your ultimate problem is there's a lot of great music and there's limited opportunities, and festivals are one of those things. So you're not going to get the, the headliners unless you are supported by something else. The way that festivals are booked is, the festival needs the headliners to sell the tickets, and the headliners have booking agents that are developing new bands. So 90% so of the lineup is determined by the booking agent saying, well, if you want the Cortinas, you've got to have X, Y, and Z. We've got the new band that we're developing. So one route in is you don't have to sell a million records, but you have to be in the same booking agent of a band that is selling a million records. It's, it's a very serious, mid-term strategy. If you're doing it, yeah, in our management or a record label, someone else who's got something that people want 
that they can leverage against you. That's how it works. Or you've made some connections in the music but exactly. industry. Exactly. But outside of that, yeah, or you, your brother, yeah, your brother works for so-and-so. <laughs> outside of that, which is a really yeah, sort of yeah. cliche answer, is you'd be more interested than everyone else. It's not necessarily about how good you are, it's how interesting you are, I think, in, in many realms. That, like, we've got lots of good music, tons of good music. It's quite subjective. What stands out to people who have to decide, if I've got to go through, se- I don't do it, but if I've got to go through 7,000 applications, what I'm looking for is the slightest thing that rings a tinge of recognition. Is that an interesting story or a tune could be, that just yeah, could really be, could is be well produced? About them. It could be you okay. spoke about it. It could be that I've heard the name, you know, I'm here and I know Jen because I've seen her do stuff, and I'm going, oh, I've never heard of that band. Blah, 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 blah. And you're just up against that. You're up against weight of numbers, and you can't get around that. The other thing is you go for festivals that aren't as big. I mean, I'm a big fan of small festivals are really great. Yeah. You might as well play in front of 200 people at a small festival than 200 people at the tiniest stage of the biggest festival. So you see you, what I mean. you're talking like the soon festivals, the tram lines, the live at Leeds, the Sound City. And a lot of these festivals do have a way for you to apply if you're a musician. Yeah, and they're you legit. I, I think a lot of them are legit. But genuinely, the people who have to sift through that have an impossible job. They, they're going to turn down 6,900 bands, right? So that's unfortunate for everyone. So it's, it's how you stand out. If you're going to go down that route, you've got to stand out in that environment, which is difficult. Um, but the way you stand out is not on a one-off application. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's very difficult to just write one paragraph on an email that's going to make you stand out from some. You stand out by playing regularly, releasing stuff, being interested, doing stuff in Japan and telling people you do stuff in Japan. And, you know, I bang on about it. It's, it's a marketing industry, and marketing is not just, I've got something to sell, so I'm going to tell you about it. It's being interesting, realistically, as often as you can be, so that when it gets in front of someone, they go, do you know what, I've heard about that band. I heard, oh, they're the band that did the release in Japan. And you've gone from 7,000 to the last 100, and the other 6,900 yeah. didn't have any, anything to say. For those that don't know about Off Axis, tell us all about it. So real quick, the, the festival side is a side, but the... the we run conferences, which is about you know, predominantly emerging bands and grassroots stuff and self-releasing, et cetera, et cetera. The internet's been wonderful because people can release and reach people. But the problem with live music is at the grassroots level is you tend to be able to develop an audience in your hometown because you start, every band starts with their friends and people they can immediately reach and play the small venue and they spread the word and bigger. But to go beyond your hometown, you have to be made famous if that makes sense. The model is you get so big and then someone comes along and you can be a Manchester band and people in Leeds will go, oh yeah, I've heard of them because they've been on the NME or they played on the radio. Outside of that model, it's an impossible situation. It's not that people are mean again. Mm. It's just if I'm a promoter in Leeds and you're a great band in Manchester and no one in Leeds has heard of you, it's very difficult for me to book you. And so yeah. what off axis is is gig swapping, which is a, an old 70s idea. It's, it's you, instead of doing that mechanism, you find bands that have already got fan bases in that town and you support them and they swap. And in fact, I won't go into it now because it's not, you can look it up, but it's just a version of that that's scalable. So we have bands in 85 different towns and cities that have all subscribed to that idea of like, in our hometown of Inverness, we've got 400 fans and we'd love to play in Hull, right? Or we'd love to play somewhere else. And there's bands in Hull that would work together. Supporting. Is it supporting? Yeah, you support the bands. So there's a headline and you support. But what we did is we got the festival slots through that. So Mm. we do like Kendall and what have you. Because what we did, the second problem is, A, you can't move around and B, you can't get festivals because 7,000 bands are playing. There's only 50 (laughs) slots. So we would say at the festivals, look, we can't solve that problem. You can't solve that problem. What if we make that a positive? What if you say you can earn a slot by hosting more people? If you encourage more movement of music around, especially we call off axis because it's predominantly trying to move stuff instead of into big cities that saturate out of. You say to a band from Manchester, do you want to go and play in Derby? No one's ever thought of that before. <laughs> There's people in Derby who don't get to see as much music as the people in the northern quarter that have got it falling on top of each Spoiled, other. Spoiled, aren't we? Yeah. And we've got Bill here as well. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you've been writing... Precariously v- balanced. Precariously balanced on yeah. still there. Um, you're writing across a number of platforms, including your own website. Um, That's right. How do artists approach you? Is there any specific way they would get more chance of being covered? Is it, you know, approaching people that like their type of music that they're making? Or? Yeah, um, if you look at who's sort of doing similar things in your genre or your, the sound you're making, say Hype Machine I look on or Spotify, whichever, look at the playlist maybe, and then you can see who's covering that kind of music and then you can start pitching to them or emailing. So you, emailing. you can as an artist do it's a bit it's of often homework. often what... Um, my friend here said, I've got yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Jeff said, it's just like word of mouth sometimes, isn't it? It's like someone will pass it on to you 
or often you'll just get a random email. That then they tend to be the best because <laughs> a random email from a band, and just you know. And then there are certain PR people you trust or labels you trust as well. But it's like cutting through though, isn't it? Because you get so much. Yeah. It's like you sat there as an artist, and I get asked this a lot: How do we send our music? Do we send a link? Do mm. we send an MP3? Do we fill people's inboxes? Yeah. What do we do? What do they do? Well, to in the get old to days, you? it used to be a demo or a carrier pigeon. <laughs> Or a record, an actual record. Now it's like a link or a Spotify or SoundCloud or whatever, or Bandcamp. But yeah, it's just sifting through and finding something that's interesting. I was just thinking about it before. You were talking about write, what, what would be your advice to a band, write great songs. But also it's like a lot of the best bands, they have great ideas as well. Or they, they think about what interests them outside of music as well. You know, what interests them, excites them, angers them, and then write songs about that. And I think that's what makes the great bands stand out. That's my opinion. Just truly being yourself, I think, and not being... Yeah, uh, just you being know, yourself. Just not not being fake. I mean, not that yeah. you're being fake, but just truly wearing Don't your heart be a and dick, sleeve. Well, we, we have had a discussion about that today. Being nice, networking, talking but to if people. if I could say that on show stream, though. Hanging around at gigs before you play and don't clear off after you finish your yeah. set, I think is a really valuable yeah. thing. I was talking to Fred from Say to Play the other day, and he was like, that's how we've got so much love, and I know so many people and different artists. In yeah, supporting the bands, you know, being friendly with the venues, the promoters, they're trying to help you. Just don't be an idiot. <laughs> How do you maintain and cultivate those relationships? Say you, you know, you've recorded something, you've released it, you've had some really good love off the back of it, and then you've gone and written, and it's taken. You know, something's kicked off in your life, and you've been away for a year. How do you, how do you go about getting back in touch with people? You know, is it is is there any specific way to do it? How do you strengthen that relationship? I, I, I think social media is very important now, isn't it? Between band and artists and playing shows. Playing shows is the, the biggest thing, I think. And also releasing things. You know, I did some work with the Orioles for a bit, PR work. But, you know, um, and, and they just did it by just releasing singles, small singles, good stuff over and over again, playing loads of shows, and then they got picked yeah. up. And they so also went to gigs everywhere from the age of 15. Because exactly. I first yeah. interviewed them so when they were 15. And you still find them at gigs randomly, either in Manchester, Liverpool or, or Leeds. And that, you know, they really have worked hard, I think, yeah. to, get, you, to get where they are. If you make friends on the way up, <laughs> then, you know, when, you go da when you're going down, then <laughs> they might be kind to you then, you know. Are they, are they going down? They seem to be going up and up no, and no, up. I mean, generally, like Ryan Adams, for oh, example. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's a whole other conversation, him, isn't it? Um, treating people equally. Well, I mean, band like Idols, who love them all over them, they're, they are grabbing the zeitgeist at the moment, aren't they? They've got ideas. Just, they're just, they've got great songs, but they've also got ideas beyond the music as well. I think that's sometimes what people forget, because that, that, that that's what make, will make you last, I think. I saw an article today from Too Many Blogs that was from a couple of years ago, and it was about um, fat white family, you know, basically crushing on other people to try and make themselves look more important. And it, they, it was, I think it was just like a, oh, is this deja vu? <laughs> the, same, the same thing two years later with, with three bands. Like, you know, we've all seen the tweet, right, from Robin from Clash, who's tweeted about, you know, middle class bands all, mm. you know, shouting on, on each other and social media. If you're not looking out, it's quite entertaining. Um, <laughs> right, so we have got a couple of tiny questions, which I'm going to ask a very quick question. Jen, how did you get on South by Southwest? All by your, like, all your own work, really, wasn't it? Um, well, we applied. Uh, we paid, I think it's the $30 application fee. Very steep. We felt like it Expensive. was worth a try. Um, we always wanted to go to South by Southwest. I was kind of obsessed with it um, for many, many years. Um, and then we got invited, um, and then we basically got in touch with everyone that we could um, from the UK side of the industry, and also from the things that we thought were good, good ideas to get in touch with, having done some research over, at, over in Austin and people who run showcases. Um, we basically kind of tried to contact as many people as we could, explain to them why we were going, um, formed a campaign that would tie into the, the time we were there. Um, obviously tried to get funding to do it. Um, we found out that we did manage to get funding to do it, which was awesome from UKTI. And they booked us for a slot at the British Music Embassy. And then when we landed, so we had another showcase as well, because um, everyone gets one official showcase at South By. When we landed, we landed to a phone call from um, 
I can't remember who it was, a DIY magazine, but someone basically saying, a band's dropped out, they've had visa issues, do you want to play um, this showcase, um, on official showcase on the Monday night? Um, like, do you want to do it? Because we, we really want you to do it. And we were like, oh my God, yes. And then we like cancelled our rehearsals that we booked and were like, just there, like, okay, here we go. And it was the best show that we played. We were so lucky to get that slot. So important thing there, anything can happen, in, in, especially at somewhere like Austin, because visa issues are really prevalent. So having accessible routes to be contacted, like phone and email and being on those kind of things, like not in America with no data or no Wi-Fi, is really important <laughs> for just being in the right place at the right time to get those opportunities. You were fab, by the way, at South By. I was there that year, and uh, we did try and get you on BBC Introducing. We did, didn't we, as a result of it? So we did. It's being organised, isn't it? It's being organised, but you, you mentioned UKTI, which is really important. I'm not sure a lot of people know about UK, UKTI, who actually lead the British Embassy programming um, for South by Southwest um, and various other exports of British music abroad. So if you haven't looked into that, well worth a Google mm -hmm. um, if you want to... Definitely. Any more sage advice there, Jen? Definitely work as a team as well. Um, we all teamed up and worked together on, on all of these things. Um, and we all emailed lot, uh, like a different kind of type of people at different times. So, so yeah, one person, the three people working together is way better than one person working together. So well, be organized, yeah. but also don't. I, I could have just like sat there and been like, I will do it all. But it wouldn't have, would never have happened. Never, never. You got people down to your shows as well just by saying, oh, yeah, we're in such a band, getting talking to them and saying we're playing at such a place and they would come down and watch you, which yeah, is a really great way to do it as well. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. I know. Incredible. Like, it's an incredible experience. We were so lucky to get to go. It was amazing. So... Was it expensive? Yeah. Um, so it was very expensive, expensive We did it? it on a complete budget, though, and we managed to cover our costs. Wow. You did well. We did it... Um, I'm not sure what the most up-to-date visa um, advice is, but at the time when we went, um, the advice was, it was a bit of a grey area, uh, but if you're only playing official showcases, uh, two years ago, we were advised that we'd be fine to do it on an ESTA. Uh, but if we had booked, booked any additional paid showcases or unofficial showcases, we would have been, like, pushing our luck. It would, could have been illegal. So, so we stuck to that and we were fine. But it's grey area. Don't know what it's like now. Yeah, I can Brexit. imagine you need to be really careful about those things, especially with the uh, change in administration <laughs> that's of course. happened over the last few years. So, uh, Jeff, what can bands do to maximise their opportunities to get gigs? Is there anything they can do, that anything yeah, right you, you now what, they can right? change? What you have to do is be a really nice person and good all of the time. And people notice, I can, if, so, if I got a phone call right now saying, Jeff, we need a band tomorrow for this, I already know the five bands I'd ring. Can you whittle it and down I to also just know, five? And I also <laughs> know the 20 bands I'm definitely not going to ring. So what you yeah. won't get is someone emailing saying, you know, I don't like the way you acted mm. and I ain't going to book you again. That doesn't happen. No they one's going to bother. They again. just won't book So I get it. You know, I put bands on a low. I put them on city and stuff. And you, I'd say 95% of the bands I've dealt with in my life, 98% from... Big famous bands to brand new bands are really brilliant, lovely ace people. And then every once in a while, someone thinks they're Liam Gallagher. And you put up with it, and they come in, and it's like, you know, don't drink on the stage, and they're there with a the lager on the stage, and the sound guy's like, oh, no, don't, check. yeah, blah, blah, blah. And no, you know, everyone gets a bit arsed. And then you're never, ever, 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 ever going to book that band again. And nor is anyone else, right? And they'll think that they got away with this swaggery amazingness, but why is every other band getting more gigs than them? And no one emails them saying, because you're a bunch of... You know, blah, blah, blah. So, <clears throat> and if you're really good at bad gigs, it stands out. Yep. So when you get that Tuesday night gig, because the promoter missold it and put a massive venue together and told you to play it, still play it like it's the best gig ever. Because who will see it will be the promoter, the venue owner, and the salmon, and the barman, and whoever's there. And in three weeks' time, when the touring band comes through and someone drops out, the barman will say at the sound man, do you remember three weeks ago when we had that crap night and that band came and blew the roof off it anyway? Give them a ring. Right? It's not hard to stand out. There's thousands of bands in this city and around the country that don't really stand out, which sounds weird, doesn't it? Like, musically they might, but it's like beyond that. And you get to know quite quickly when you're booking bands or when you're working with bands, or like in any industry, there's the people who are like really easy to work with, yeah. really solid, really reliable, turn up, don't drink on stage if you've asked them not to, etc., etc. And that's the same whether you're dealing with 
you know, radio heads or a band who's just started out. Everyone is really super professional all the time. And just because Liam Gallagher makes it look like being a musician means you have to be some flippant affluent, you know, like, oh, or this, or arrogant, or whatever. It does not ever, ever, ever work like that, ever. It's not uh, even the Libertines, right? It, it's a car crash, but there's people paid to make sure that on the dot, on the sound check, they are there no matter what, and it will happen. And it, everyone's respectful of Pete. the fact that a lot of people, put, like look at tonight, a lot of people have put effort in to get this happen. And you've got to be respectful of that. If, even if I think I'm the biggest cock, like, cock of the North rock star that's going, you've got to be respectful that there's nothing <laughs> would have been here if it wasn't for the people who made it happen, right? No, and everyone knows that yeah. who knows it. It's, so if it's you, because you're hungry, isn't it? It's because yeah. you want it. It's so you don't believe learn. the hype. You can yeah. be all super cool in this and the other when you need to be in front of the girls or the boys or whatever, right? But beyond that... You know, answer emails quickly. Be polite. If, you, if it falls, I tell you what I really like from a band is if I email them saying, can you do this gig? And they reply straight away saying, no, sorry, we can't. I love that. Because I'm not sat waiting for a day and a half while, you know, if they got, or, or just as good an answer is within five minutes ago, I'll find out. I'll let you know by the end of the day. Those emails are gold dust. And you and I said, there's bands in my head that I know. I can name those bands. Fred's band, say to play. If I had messaged Fred right now saying, can you do this gig next Wednesday, he would reply and say, I'll let you know by tonight. Right? There's other bands who you really want to play, and you email them, and three days later you've still not heard, and then eventually, you know, blah, blah, blah. it's not hard to communicate. And I mean, I interview a lot of people. I don't know if you know me, but I work for BBC Introducing in West Yorkshire, I work for BBC Introducing in Manchester, I work for Amazing Radio, where I curate two hours of new music every week, and I'm on Excess Manchester. I've interviewed a wide array of musicians. The most famous, most successful musicians are the loveliest people you'll ever meet. Um, I, you know, some of the stories I've got about the smaller artists I've interviewed but that have just been absolutely obscenely rude. There was one that told me about a double album release they'd got coming out, which was completely fictitious. I went on to work for their record label and podcast for Wichita Recordings for about two years after that, but that was a car crash of an interview. But Chell, the point is, the reason that they're nice people is it's because they were nice people they stood yeah. talking to you, yeah. having sold 5,000... Records yeah. last week or whatever. It really is. It's a people is, industry. It really is. Yeah. The idea is cool now to be, you know, rock and roll star or whatever. I've yet to it's, meet it's any <laughs> successful person. Yeah, it's, like it's, that. It's, it's, it's not anymore, is it? It's not. Even Liam Gallagher makes a cup of tea. He is underneath it all a very nice person. I think he's been getting some bad press here. We all it's like Liam, right? We all like Liam. Yeah. So, Bill, um, obviously you know a lot more about online press and obviously about um, getting your music placed on online portals that could be read by the masses. Where should an artist start? Is there any really good ones that you would reach out to? Would it be blogs or would it be more websites like Clash Magazine or the, or the bigger ones? Would you start like local blog? Yeah, I'd look local, see who's really into music locally. People like yourself. Like Von Pip in <laughs> Liverpool is a Von really Pip, good one. Von Pip, I was going to mention him. Yeah, yeah in Liverpool. Um, there's quite, there's, there's Pop quite a little music in Liverpool as well. There's quite good. a little network, isn't there? Even Obviously, the my own website, God is in the TV, zine.co.uk. <laughs> Get that plug good in. Good plug, good plug. But, you know, we, we'll, we'll cover anything. If we like it, we'll cover it. We don't really discriminate between massive label bands or... You know, somebody just sending it themselves. So anything that you like and persuaded by more than others? Persuaded by um, good, you know, great music, <laughs> or you know, just people who are you know, like, like uh, my friend here was saying. Uh, you know, people who are, are genuine and they really, you know, they they love what they're doing. You know. So what do you do? Just drop an email, keep it yeah. simple, don't waffle on too much, or is it better to send something that looks like a press release? Because I, I just get those. send something personal, to be honest. Yeah. Hey, saw you covered this. Yeah, Sounded pretty you, good. Like, sounds a bit like what we're trying to do. If think you look you might at what they're it. covering, and then you know, just sort of I, hype machine. I think it's quite a you know. I, I didn't know even it, know that was still going. I know it's a bit. It's a bit. <laughs> you know, it's a bit out of date now. But you know, you could look at the kind of bands they're covering, and then you can go to the blogs there. But you know, generally playlists are a big thing now, obviously. So look at who cur curates playlists. I mean, some of them are you know brands and stati statisticians, I can't say that word. That's but, uh, a whole new argument and yeah, story, isn't it? How do you get your music on playlists? you put on a suit and you go down to London, but, you know, that's another, that's another question. But, you know, yeah, just try and pitch your music to them and see what they, see what they like, you know, and just, you know. 
So, okay, we have talked... Send them the music. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked quite a lot, and obviously these people are sticking around. Pick their brains. Um, take advantage of their presence in the room and help yourself um, as much as you can do. Uh, have we got a result from our Twitter poll? Is the album relevant? Hang on. So we did run two polls this week. Uh, firstly, earlier on in this, this week, we asked, how do you discover new music? Thinking everyone's just going to say, I, I go streaming, go on Spotify, go on Apple Music. Actually, it was a really, it was really key. Um, split, 20% said they discover new music through radio, 25% through a live gig. 26% through a streaming, streaming service and 29% through blogs and music magazines. So there you have it. Print press and online press is not dead. Um, so basically what this means is you need to do all of these things. So if you are an artist, you need to make sure you're kind of covering it all. I've not said much about radio, but BBC introducing AmazingTunes.com. Get your music on those platforms to try and get airplay. Tom um, Robinson's good, isn't he? Tom Robinson obviously is BBC introducing so people like me feed Tom music, which then he will reflect on BBC Six Music. And Hugh Stevens has a show on Radio One that is a BBC introducing show. There's a Excess Manchester I also work for. Sophie Svensson does a new music show. Just do a bit of homework. If you're not from Manchester, do some homework on your local stations and what kind of output they have. They'll always have a presenter that is music, music passioned, and, um, and we'll do something about it. Right, are you all ready for the big answer? Is the album relevant? What do we reckon? Yes. Yes. 91% say yes. So there you go. Although I would probably argue that if you're building a profile, singles are probably the way to do it because one great track, you lead people. Don't know if you have an idea, a, a, a suggestion on that or a, 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 an opinion. But You've got to build it up, haven't you? Yeah, you, you, if you're leading people to your best tracks, I think building a profile, that can help. But when it comes down to it, we need an album. It's not the same if it's not an album, isn't it? We just released an album pretty much straight away. I don't regret it. <laughs> People said we shouldn't have done that, but I don't know. Well, you, you feel like Fickle Friends released about 15 singles before they released an album, and I think the label was a major label, said every, every, single, every track on this has got to be an absolute banger. That's no pressure, is it? Speaking as a music fan, if you really love a band, you're going to buy their album, aren't you? Let's be honest, at the end. Yeah. Thank you so much to our panellists. Thanks for coming down tonight. On the stage next, we have... I haven't got the piece of paper. Uh, and I've got a memory like a sieve. But thanks to Jen, thanks to Jeff, and thanks to Bill. Stick around, honestly, as a producer for BBC Intro. Um, there's some incredible music from Manchester and Leeds right here. And Hebden Bridge via now in Manchester. And all of my territories all here tonight. Uh, incredible music. Thanks for coming down and enjoy the rest of the night. <laughs>